With Apple's latest announcement of the M1 Ultra, its fourth and final member of the M1 family of Apple Silicon, I think it's time we take a look at the state of APUs. More than just a CPU with integrated graphics, APUs have evolved to include a bunch of other accelerators. Today I'll take a look at the recently launched 6000 series from AMD with integrated graphics, the existing Iris graphics from Intel, and the aforementioned Apple M1 Ultra, and we'll look at how future APUs might look like. This video is sponsored by UCDKeys.com. UCD Keys offers Windows 10 and Windows 11 Pro keys at super affordable prices. Currently, they have Windows 11 Pro for $21 and Windows 10, which is what I personally use, for just $14. There's also Office Keys of various kinds. I've used this service myself, as have lots of my patrons and viewers, and the service works great, and the keys work globally. We're partnering with UCD Keys for a special offer. By using the coupon code C30, you will get an additional 20% off of any purchase. Visit ucdkeys.com or click the links in the description. For the Intel integrated graphics side, I'll be featuring the Minis Forum Task Mini TH50, which Minis Forum kindly provided for this video. Minis Forum have a range of mini PCs, and this is one of their most recent ones, featuring a Tiger Lake H chip. This particular mini PC comes with a 65 USB Type-C power adapter and some brackets for SSD expandability. The unit features audio in and out, two USB 3.0 ports, a full Thunderbolt 4 port with support for display out, which opens up a wide range of possibilities including connecting an external GPU to this thing. On the back there are two USB 2.0 ports, two more USB 3.2 ports, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, a full-size display port, and a full-size HDMI port, which unfortunately is not 2.1, and a USB power port. Specs-wise, this unit features an i5-11320H with four cores and eight threads that goes up to 4.4 gigahertz. My review sample came with 16 gigabytes of low power DDR4 soldered to the board running at 3200 megahertz. This unit came with storage included but that's optional when you buy it. So there's a 512 gig M.2 drive inside right now. And finally we have Iris XC graphics with 96 execution units running at 1.35 gigahertz. Despite its tiny size, running under load, the maximum temperature this PC got to was 81 degrees degrees Celsius, although while gaming it was around 58 degrees on average. So very cool and quiet for such a small form factor, and as you'll see, without compromising too much on performance. So as configured, you can expect to pay around $600 for this very capable mini PC, and we'll take a look at some performance numbers in a second. Jumping up a tier, we have the exciting new Asus G14, which comes at $1,640. There are no mini PCs yet with the AMD 6000 series APUs, so this is the best we can do for a comparison. If you'd like me to test a Ryzen 6000 based mini PC, let me know in the comments and I'll get a sample sorted for a future video. The integrated graphics on the 6900HS is the 35 watt 680M, so we'll use that and ignore the discrete graphics. And the G14 laptop comes with DDR5, so we should see a significant jump in performance from the Intel Iris XC. This is not meant to be an apples to apples comparison between Intel and AMD, as these aren't even from the same generation. We're just looking at tiers in terms of pricing here right now to see what sort of performance you can expect at each tier of APU. And finally, at the top end, there's the newly announced Apple M1 Ultra, which on paper at least looks like a very interesting piece of silicon. There are a couple of reviews out there already, so we'll use those for our comparison. Of course, the Apple M1 Ultra is currently only available on the Mac Studio, which is effectively a mini PC and costs a whopping $4,000. There's also a $2,000 option, but that's with the M1 Max. Looking first at the Intel and AMD options, we can see a significant evolution from gen to gen. In Forza Horizon 5, the Minis Forum TH50 averaged 35 FPS at 1080p low with a resolution scale set to quality, while with the same settings, AMD's 680M integrated graphics got an impressive 87 FPS on average, and that's limited to 35 watts on the 
the G14 laptop. If it were running on a mini PC, one could push it to 45 watts or higher and get even better performance. Still, this is an improvement of 148% from the Tiger Lake generation to the current top-of-the-line AMD APUs. In Borderlands 3, the Minis Forum TH50 averaged 39 FPS at 900p low settings, while the G14 680M got 78 FPS with the same settings. So a literal doubling of performance from the last generation of APUs to the latest. And finally, I tested God of War, which supports FSR, a technology that's very relevant to APUs and will be more so with the next generation of FSR launching soon. The TH50 got 33 FPS on average at 1080p original settings, with FSR set to performance, while the G14 came in at 40 FPS average with the same settings, which is lower than I expected, but this is a game that I found to be poorly optimized on the PC. Still, it's a 21% improvement gen-to-gen -gen and tier-to-tier price-wise. So, on average, with this limited set of games, we're seeing an improvement of 90% uplift from one generation to the next. Again, this is not apples to apples, it's just to give us a general idea of how APUs are evolving. The Intel Iris XC seems mostly geared towards eSports still, and of course emulation, while AMD's newest 6ATM can do AAA gaming at 60fps comfortably with a mix of low and medium settings. It will be interesting to test these with FSR 2.0 when it comes out, as one could conceivably play 1080p high or very high settings on the 6000 series AMD APUs at 60fps and above, making entry-level GPUs pretty much obsolete. Now, what about Apple's latest and greatest? How does the M1 Ultra fit into this? The Verge has a surprisingly decent review with some benchmarks and for the most part, the M1 Ultra SoC delivers the goods. People who don't follow technology closely are raving about Apple putting two chips together in the same package. In reality, this is nothing new. Apple is likely using TSMC's Info LSI packaging process to breach together two M1 chips. We've seen this before in the PC space with Intel's KB Lake G all the way back in 2017, and more recently with Sapphire Rapids using IMEV. So there's nothing revolutionary about the M1 Ultra. What's impressive about it is that Apple is betting on it for a mainstream, low-volume product. Typically, your workstation user will require lots of PCIe expandability for add-in cards, be it GPUs or other accelerators. So the studio's audience seems to be limited to content creators like 3D artists, audio engineers, video editors, that sort of crowd that need a bit more power than a MacBook but can't necessarily afford or justify the Mac Pro towers. Bridging two M1 chips together is a smart way to bring this level of performance to a mainstream audience without having to design a dedicated new chip. It's in a way similar to what AMD has done with chiplets, making it a lot more affordable to scale chips. Of course, this comes with costs, particularly in latency, but we'll come back to that. So looking at the performance numbers, we see that in Geekbench 5 GPU compute, the Mac Studio got crushed by a similarly specced system within an RTX 3090. Obviously, the lies that Apple puts on their marketing materials are precisely that, lies. There's no way this chip was ever going to be faster than a 3090, but that's not the point really. This is an APU, an SoC with integrated graphics, and it's actually matching a Mac Pro equipped with two discrete Radeon Pro Vega 2 GPUs. Moving on to games, the only one tested was Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here the M1 Ultra managed an impressive 96 FPS average at 1440p versus 114 on the RTX 3090 PC. Remember, these are integrated graphics versus the top discrete GPU, and the integrated graphics are only losing by 15%, or even matching the 3090 depending on which review you see. That's a remarkable result for Apple here, and it gives us a glimpse of what is about to happen to the entry-level and mid-range segments in GPU land. And looking at the CPU portion of the M1 Ultra alone, the results continue to impress, with the M1 Ultra beating a 16-core Xeon W in both single-core and multi-core in Cinebench R23. I doubt that the M1 Ultra will beat a 12900K in single-core performance, but again, the M1 Ultra is an APU, an SoC with a CPU and GPU integrated, running at only 60 watts, while the 12900K can get close to 270 watts under stress. This discrepancy in efficiency means you can have this level of performance in such a 
tiny form factor and in fact leading in performance in some instances. Personally, I wouldn't buy an Apple product no matter how good it was, but that's just a personal choice. I know a lot of people out there for whom a Mac Studio will be the perfect system to get. I should note that a Mac Studio doesn't even support HDMI 2.1, <laughs> which for a product of this range seems like a big fail and another reason I wouldn't get one. But anyway, regardless of how I feel about the company, it's undeniable that Apple is leading the charge here as far as APUs are concerned, and the M1 Ultra shows that APUs are getting to the point of not just making entry-level GPUs irrelevant, but soon also high-end ones. One can expect the next generations of Ryzen and Intel chips with integrated graphics to make a single SoC actually a viable option for gamers, without the need for a dedicated discrete GPU, especially when you consider technologies like FSR, TLSS, and XESS. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next few years the discrete GPU becomes irrelevant, or at least the exclusive domain of the very high-end gaming rigs. As of today, as we saw, you have different options depending on how much you are willing to spend, at each tier the performance jumping significantly. Personally, I can't wait to get my hands on a mini PC with an AMD 680M with more headroom in terms of wattage. I think that's where the sweet spot will be in terms of price to performance for a small form factor PC. Make sure you're subscribed if you'd like to follow my coverage on the evolution of APUs. This video was made possible by my awesome patrons. YouTube ad revenue is now almost non-existent, so it's up to you guys to support smaller channels like mine. Join my Patreon today and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where a welcoming community of enthusiasts discusses technology daily, and where I often share exclusive bits of information. If you can't contribute financially at this point, then please give this video a like and share it with friends, as that really helps. Thanks for watching and until the next one.